Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome back to part two of my lecture on chapter 19, air pollution and ozone depletion. Uh, we left off in part one talking about acid deposition, uh, mainly acid rain, but also uh, solid uh, uh, particles uh, of, uh, of, of highly acidic uh, particles could also uh, fall from the sky, not necessarily only acid rain, even though when we talk about acid deposition, uh, that's pretty much what we're talking about. We're now, now going to move on uh, in the chapter to uh, 19.4, and this is what are the major indoor air pollution problems. So uh, we talked about in uh, chapter uh, part one of this uh, lecture about outdoor air pollution. Now we're going to talk about indoor air pollution. So what are indoor air pollutants? Well, smoke, soot from burning wood and coal in cooking fires. Now you're probably saying to yourself, what are you talking about, Mr. Van Eck? Well, again, you got to think about the globe, uh, the entire earth, when we uh, talk about environmental science. And still in less developed countries, most people still cook and or warm their homes by burning wood or coal indoors. So you can only imagine what happens when you burn wood or coal indoors and maybe you don't have a chimney that takes all that uh, all that smoke out. Uh, a lot of that smoke gets left indoors. And again, uh, it's a major problem in less developed countries, uh, this indoor air pollutants. Obviously, cigarette smoke is an indoor air pollutant, not as much uh, these days as uh, in the past, thank goodness. Um, I remember when I was your age and uh, or maybe a couple of years older than you, uh, old enough to go into bars, uh, in my 20s, I would come out of bars and I would stink like cigarette smoke for days. Every part of you, your hair, your clothes would be disgusting. Uh, not the case anymore because you're no longer uh, allowed to smoke uh, uh, in bars. So uh, again, still could be an issue though. And chemicals used in building materials and cleaning products uh, can also produce indoor air pollution. So once again, a serious problem, especially in less developed countries. Again, the indoor burning of wood, charcoal, dung, which is basically poop, uh, crop residues, and coal, uh, obviously lead to indoor air pollution and it's the greatest risk to low income populations around the, the around the earth is this indoor air pollution that they're basically producing uh, by trying to keep themselves warm and to keep and to cook their food uh, using these old traditional methods in more developed countries like the United States tobacco smoke is a more of an indoor air pollution problem formaldehyde uh, radioactive radon gas which we'll talk about in a little bit uh, and very small particles that are suspended in the atmosphere atmosphere uh, end up being an issue uh, indoors as well. So uh, here's a, a basically a, a chart here of some indoor uh, air pollutants found in most modern homes. Uh, so obviously, you know, the routine definitely have a couple of these in mind, just in case you have to uh, pull them out for an FRQ somewhere. Uh, but you'll no, notice uh, chloroform, for instance, uh, chlorine treated water in, in, in hot showers. You'll notice nitrogen oxides, uh, some un unvented gas stoves, kerosene heaters, etc. Particulates from pollen, maybe pet dander, right? Dust mites, um, fireplaces. I know now when I turn my fireplace on or when I use my fireplace, I have a wood fireplace, I actually uh, put my um, I got a new air filter in my home and I actually turned it on just in case some of the smoke happens to get into the house. Uh, it'll, 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 it'll clean it out. Uh, carbon monoxide, faulty furnaces, unvented gas stoves, some asbestos pipe insulation. There's your radon uh, basically in the basement coming uh, up from the ground. Uh, lead from old water pipes, old paint. There's your formaldehyde. All right, et cetera, et cetera. So all of our homes do have a uh, items that produce indoor air pollution. And again, just uh, have a couple of these in mind, again, just in case you need to uh, use them for an FRQ. So levels of some common air pollutants, two to five times higher inside U.S. homes and buildings than outdoors, sometimes up to 100 times higher. So again, you may not think about pollution indoors, in the air indoors, uh, but yes, uh, in some homes, it could be up to 100 times higher in some homes and buildings. Pollution levels in inside cars could be up to 18 times higher than in outdoor uh, levels as well. Uh, many people smoke cigarettes in their cars still and don't uh, put the windows down. I don't know how you do that. Uh, but again, that's just an example uh, of how the pollution levels inside a car can be much greater than outside. Most people in more developed urban areas spend 70% or more of their time indoors or in inside vehicles. Uh, again, most of us uh, in well-developed countries like the U.S. aren't hanging out outdoors as much anymore. We spend most of our time indoors or 
we're in vehicles 70% of our time. And so obviously indoor air pollution really is something that we should worry about almost uh, as much as outdoor, because while outdoor air pollution is obviously uh, affecting the environment as well as our own personal health, uh, we're spending 70% of our time either indoors or inside vehicles where the air pollution uh, content significantly higher than it is outdoors. So that's something to think about uh, as we go through the 21st century. Core case study talks about radioactive radon gas. So what is this radon gas we're talking about? Uh, you don't hear us so much about it nowadays, but I know uh, when I was growing up out, out in New Jersey, uh, we definitely had our basement tested numerous times for radon gas. Radar gra uh, radon gas is uh, basically underground deposits of certain materials uh, that basically uh, decay. Uh, we talk about this radioactive decay. You should have done that in earth science and in chemistry. Uh, basically, it decays into polonium 210, which can expose lung tissue to large amounts of radiation. So this is a big issue. Again, it comes up from the ground uh, and comes through cracks in your foundation of your home. And that's why normally uh, it's found at the highest levels in people's basements that happen to be underground. The Environmental Protection Agency recommends that you conduct radon tests uh, in your home so that then if you do have some radon in your basement, you can seal uh, any cracks that, that, that you may have. So you'll notice uh, this is a core case study here, uh, basically ways that radon-222 gas can enter homes and other buildings. Again, it's coming in from the ground, from the soil, basically comes in from cracks in the floor, maybe sub pumps, maybe joints or uh, windows or something like that, okay? Uh, but basically in the basement is where most of this is found. And again, just test for it. And if you have it, uh, then you can seal up these cracks uh, to be able to keep that radon gas in the soil and not bring that air pollution into your home. So what are the health effects of air pollution, right? So we've been talking about it. Uh, we've talked about some of the environmental effects. Well, there's obviously health effects on uh, human beings, right? Asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, lung cancer, heart attack, and stroke uh, are are just the major uh, issues that air pollution uh, can uh, can provide us. So our body does have a natural defense against air pollution, but unfortunately, we're putting so much air pollution in not only outdoors, but indoors, uh, that unfortunately, our natural defenses can be overwhelmed, very similar to Earth's natural defenses being overwhelmed, right? Uh, same thing with us human beings. So we have hair, cilia, and mucus in our respiratory system, which actually helps prevent against um, against air pollution, right? So we have hair and cilia in our, in our nose um, and lining our, our throats, right, that actually uh, can trap or can pick up some of those particles, those small particles that we breathe in, kind of trap them. And then we have mucus, which basically kind of, uh, that's kind of that phlegm that basically if any particles do get into the lungs, the mucus will then trap them and kind of, you know, get them together and then you can kind of expel them uh, uh, by coughing, uh, et cetera. So um, what are the effects of smoking and prolonged air, air pollution exposure? Again, talking about that chronic bronchitis and emphysema, uh, those are issues with the lungs defense systems. And when you have bronchitis and or emphysema, your lung cannot defend itself as much or your respiratory system against those pollutants. And so the pollutants begin to overwhelm you. So again, nasal cavity, oral cavity, we the throat. Again, you have the cilia uh, out there that helps protect uh, helps block some of the larger particles. The mucus then helps deal with the uh, smaller particles. And again, uh, you want this stuff away from the lungs because if you have air pollution in the lungs, then unfortunately um, you get a lot of these uh, these alveolar sacs uh, then get um, air pollution in them and that then disrupts the breathing system, disrupt, disrupts the oxygen uh, getting to the blood system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and then you can develop those uh, those chronic problems. 125,000 people develop cancer in the United States each year from breathing diesel fumes. So that's another uh, form of air pollution that is harming humans. And 14% of the U.S. population is exposed to excessive particulate pollution levels daily. Again, and particulates are finely uh, fine particles that are suspended in the air that then you breathe in. And most of them come from coal burning or industrial power plants, um, these, these particles. So again, 14% of the U.S. population exposed to them on a daily basis. This is a map of the distribution of premature deaths in the United States from air pollution. And again, these are those particulates we talk about mainly coming from coal burning power plants. So you'll notice... Um, 
um, where are our most deaths per year right here in the Midwest where most of your coal burning power plants are, right? If you know West Virginia, uh, they burn a lot of coal still in West Virginia. So you'll notice here is where the issues are. This is where most of your coal plants are. You'll notice out West, they don't have a lot of these coal burning power plants. So out West, you're not seeing um, a problem with air pollution as much as you are further East. In addition, out West is a lot more rural, mountainous, forest, a lot more population, of, of course, across the East here. But again, this area right here, the red and the purples, that's where most of your coal is burned. And so it's no really shouldn't question why more people are dying there from um, from air pollution because again these coal power plants leave those particulates in the air that then you breathe in and then overwhelms your respiratory defense system uh, causing those chronic problems that eventually lead to death so how should we deal with air pollution? Well, legal, economic, and technological tools can help clean up air pollution. As always in this class, I hope you're learning that solution is the best way to prevent it. Once you have, once you've polluted your air, it's much, much, much harder and much more costly to clean it up. So the idea is prevent it before it gets out much cheaper and much better, uh, much, much, much easier to deal with. So we've had a bunch of laws and regulations that have reduced outdoor air pollution over the years. So definitely understand these. Uh, the Clean Air Acts, the uh, first one was in 1970, and then obviously it was re-upped and uh, amended in 1977 and 1990. Uh, these created uh, air pollution regulations that are enforced by states and cities. The Environmental Protection Agency has established air quality standards for six outdoor pollutants, those pollutants are carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, suspended particulate matter, ozone, and lead, right? So for those six, there are levels and um, of air quality standards that we need to be at. And if we're not at, then the EPA has the power to uh, basically tell your power plant or your industrial plant, uh, hey, you need to, uh, you need to uh, lower your, your, your pollution of these six outdoor pollutants. Now, obviously, there are many more than six, so that's the problem, but hey, baby steps, right? So at least we have air quality standards for these six pollutants. I would definitely memorize those pollutants. The EPA natural emission standards for 188 hazardous air pollutants uh, has been put out as well. They're called HAPS. Uh, and there's also a toxic release inventory as well, TRI, uh, which the Environmental Protection Agency has uh, to help us look at some of these uh, toxic chemicals. We do have some new U.S. regulations uh, limiting the amount of carbon dioxide emissions from coal fire fired power plants. And actually, China has ha enacted some new air quality standards as well. Uh, they're banning uh, the high sulfur and the high ash content coal in major cities. You remember a couple of chapters ago, we talked about coal and how there's high sulfur, low sulfur, high sulfur being the cheapest, but the uh, but the dirtiest, right? Um, so they're actually banning that in, in China. So they're still they're still burning coal, but uh, they're banning the high sulfur and going to the low sulfur, uh, low low sulfur uh, coal, which at least is a is a little bit cleaner. Again, again, baby steps, right? Uh, but at least we're moving in the right direction here. So here are some levels of key air pollutants in the United States and showing how they drop sharply between 1980 and 2015. Uh, and again, that has to do with, uh, with those acts, um, the Clean Air Act and the other acts that the Environmental Protection Agency has put into play. So uh, you'll notice, even though our gross domestic product and the amount of vehicles and the population and our energy, right, and our carbon dioxide emissions have all gone up uh, over the past, uh, what is that, past, uh, you know, 35, 40 years or so, you'll notice the those six common pollutants that we talked about on the previous slide, right? If you aggregate them all together, they've actually dropped by 65%. So this is a success story. Again, I'm trying to show you some success stories in environmental science. This is a success story. Obviously, there's much more that needs to be done, uh, but at least our outdoor air pollution, when you look at those six common pollutants, uh, at least since 1980, they have been dropping dramatically. So again, uh, kudos for us as a human population here in the U.S., understanding it, putting in these uh, clean air acts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now we just need to get the rest of the world to uh, jump on board and hopefully uh, that minus 65% will continue uh, to drop over the years.
So we can use the marketplace to reduce outdoor air pollution, right? This is that full cost pricing we talk about. Buy and sell air pollution allotments in the marketplace. So in 1990, the Clean Air Act actually, as one of the amendments, authorized emissions trading or a cap and trade program. So again, what this is saying is um, you can buy and sell air pollution. So let's say my company doesn't really have a lot of air pollution. I can sell my allotment of air pollution to another con company that may need it because they're producing too much air pollution. The idea of this is that eventually companies will realize, hey, that other company's making money by not polluting. I'm losing money by buying his pollution allotment because I'm still polluting a lot. Maybe I need to stop polluting so I can make more money. That's the idea of this uh, admissions trading or this cap and trade program. And again, the success depends on how low the initial cap is set and how often that, that initial cap is lowered. Uh, but again, it's an idea to basically force people to stop polluting uh, by looking at their bottom line, by looking at the dollar amount uh, and hopefully uh, causing them to spend more money to pollute and less money to not pollute. We also have other ways to reduce outdoor air pollution. So there are some technologies uh, in coal burning power plants uh, that we've developed. One is called an electrostatic precipitator and the other is a wet scrubber. We'll take a look at that in just a second. Uh, for motor vehicle pollution, really we just have to prevent and we just have to reduce uh, the uh, our motor vehicle use and or trans um, try to uh, get to more of those hybrid or electronic vehicles that we talked about in a previous chapter. So what we're looking at here on the left is an electrostatic precipitator, on the right is a wet scrubber. And again, they're just different ways that uh, we can use to uh, reduce the, uh, the par particulate and the sulfur dioxide emissions from coal powered plants. So you notice what happens here, uh, we have Basically, an elect in the electrostatic uh, precipitator, dirty smoke comes into it. It it rises up where you basically have a neg negatively charged electrode and a positively charged precipitator wall. This causes um, the uh, any particulates to be left behind here with that uh, difference in charge. The clean gas goes out and that dust or those particulates then settle into a collector where we take them to a landfill. Now we talked about issues with landfills in a previous chapter, uh, but obviously uh, it's better at this point than putting it into the air. Wet scrubber, sign it kind, of, sign it kind of the same way, uh, kind of the same thing. The dirty smoke goes in. You have all this liquid water that actually uh, acts to uh, wash out the, the air. So then the clean gas goes up and the polluted liquid or the sludge comes down, again, goes into a truck and then gets delivered to a landfill somewhere. So again, just two different ways, one dry, one wet, uh, but it's a technology that has been developed to help remove all those particulates, those particles, those fine particles from, uh, from the uh, smokestack of, uh, of coal burning uh, industrial plants to, to, help, uh, to help clean out the atmosphere. So our favorite chart here, uh, stationary source air pollution, prevention and reduction. So prevention, burn low sulfur coal or remove sulfur from coal altogether. Convert coal to that liquid or that gaseous fuel that we talked about in previous chapters or just switch from coal to natural gas or renewable energy, which is much cleaner. Uh, on the other side, disperse emissions, which increase downwind using tall smokestacks. So again, if you're going to pollute, Make sure the smokestacks are really, really tall so that then the pollution gets dispersed. All right. Remove pollutants from smokestack gases. That's what we talked about just previously with the uh, electrostatic precipitator and the wet scrubber. And again, tax each unit of pollution produced. And again, allow companies to trade, uh, to trade their pollution allotment to make money by not polluting. Motor vehicle air pollution, same thing, prevention, walk, bike, or use mass transit, right? And fuel, improve fuel efficiency or get older polluting cars off the road. To reduce it, require admission control devices, inspect car exhaust systems twice a year, and set strict admission standards uh, on those cars. So again, that's ways to reduce, uh, you know, again, stationary air pollution compared to mobile air pollution, which are your motor vehicles. Um, so again, you know the routine here. Just understand a couple of things uh, from these charts. All right, back now to indoor air pollution, right? How can we, re we reduce that, especially uh, in those uh, underdeveloped countries? So indoor air pollution, again, a greater 
greater health threat to humans than outdoor air pollution because uh, we spend more time indoors, especially in well-developed countries. So what can be done, right? Prevention and cleanup. So here are some solutions, right? Uh, so prevention on the left, ban indoor smoking. That's been done, especially in many places here in the United States. Set stricter formaldehyde emission standards for carpet, furniture, and building materials. Prevent that radon infiltration, right? By sealing your basement, making sure there are no cracks. Use naturally based cleaning agents, paints, and other products uh, instead of unnatural synthetic ones. What can you reduce or dilute the indoor air pollution? Well, use adjustable fresh air vents for workspaces. Circulate the air more frequently, which will disperse uh, and, and, and dilute the air pollution. Uh, circulate a building's air through rooftop greenhouses to clean out the air as well. And use solar cookers and efficient vented wood burning stoves. Uh, this would be especially for the underdeveloped countries instead of just burning wood in their home to cook. And then all that smoke, all that soot remains in the home for everyone to breathe, okay? So what can you do? Indoor air pollution, test for radon and formaldehyde. Do not buy furniture with formaldehyde. Tech your, uh, test your home for asbestos. If you smoke, do it outside. Make sure any wood-burning stoves, fireplaces, and gas-burning heaters are, are, are properly installed and vented. Install carbon monoxide detectors in your home. I definitely have them in mind. Use fans to circulate indoor air. Grow house plants, right, which help clean out the air. Do not store gasoline, solvents, or other volatile hazardous chemicals inside your home or in an attached garage. And remove your shoes before entering your house to reduce inputs of dust, uh, dust, lead, and a pesticide. So again, just simple things you can do. Obviously, there may be an FRQ where you need to uh, pull a few of these out. Uh, so definitely just understand some things you can do to reduce outdoor air pollution. Okay, final thing we'll talk about is ozone, all right? So we talked about air pollution, and ozone is a pollutant, right? It's a secondary pollutant um, in the stratosphere. We love it because it protect, uh, protects us from UV radiation, uh, but on the surface, it's very bad for our lungs. So widespread use of certain chemicals have reduced the ozone levels in the stratosphere. So we're going to talk about the stratosphere first and the ozone layer there. Again, this has allowed more harmful ultraviolet radiation to reach Earth's surface. Once again, ozone O3 protects us from ultraviolet radiation. Uh, it is located in the stratosphere, which is the second layer of Earth's atmosphere above the troposphere. And without the ozone layer, there would be no life on this planet because without the ozone layer, ultraviolet radiation would get through and any cells that started to evolve would have been uh, killed or mutated or um, basically destroyed by that ultraviolet radiation. So thank you. Uh, thank you, ozone in the in the stratosphere. Uh, we need you. Uh, and unfortunately, though, ozone levels have been reduced in the stratosphere because of certain chemicals. So we need actions necessary to reverse that ozone depletion stop producing ozone depleting chemicals and adhere to international treaties banning such chemicals. So what are we talking about? What are these chemicals? All right. So the ozone is thinning over Antarctica and the Arctic. They're called chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. Okay. These are persistent chemicals that attack ozone in the stratosphere. Takes 11 to 20 years to reach the stratosphere from ground level. So if you release some CFCs, it takes 15 or so years for them to actually get up into the stratosphere to start destroying ozone. What happens is the CFC molecule attacks the O3 and strips and strips off a free oxygen. That free oxygen, right, now then combines with chlorine to form a, a chlorine and oxygen molecule. That chlorine atom then can break down hundreds of ozone molecules. So that's what happens, right? These chlorofluorocarbons have chlorine in them. Chlorine gets up into the sky. As you know, oxygen really likes to be O2, not O3. So the chlorine goes up there and basically strips one of the oxygens away from the O3, making it O2, takes that oxygen and, and combines it to itself to form a, a chlorine and oxygen molecule. But unfortunately, that's not the problem. The chlorine and oxygen molecule is not the problem. The problem is the O3 is now O2. Well, diatomic oxygen does not block UV radiation. Only O3 does, or ozone, with three, three, uh, three uh, oxygen uh, 
uh, atoms together there, right? So that's the problem, okay? And again, each chlorine atom can actually break down hundreds of of of, ox, of, oath, of uh, ozone molecules, right? That's what actually happens. So you got one chlorine and it can just keep destroying by pulling off the one oxygen from all the ozone. And now, unfortunately, you have O2, which again, cannot protect us from ultraviolet radiation. So this is what we talk about when we talk about an ozone hole. Now, I will say this was a much bigger problem back when I was your age in the 80s and 90s. We actually have enacted, uh, we'll talk about them in just a second, um, a bunch of protocols around the, the earth. And uh, we've actually seen this hole start to fill in a little bit. Okay, But you'll notice this is what we're talking about. These holes usually show up uh, over the poles, uh, usually during the winter months. Uh, of those poles. For instance, this hole is in October uh, 2015. Um, so again, they usually show up. You'll notice how the ozone has thinned here, okay? And that obviously is problems because more ultraviolet radiation is getting down. So ozone protects the earth from damaging UV radiation, human health concerns. UV radiation also affects plankton, uh, which are crucial for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So again, ultraviolet radiation is not good. That's why the ozone helps to protect us. So how do we reverse stratospheric ozone depletion? Again, stop producing those CFCs. Uh, it will take at least 60 years to recover, but we are on our way to doing that. So the Montreal Protocol was actually put into effect 1989, I believe, uh, cut emissions uh, of CFCs. And then uh, shortly thereafter, the Copenhagen Amendment was added to that, which accelerated the phasing out of these chlorofluorocarbons. And especially now in the United States, uh, we really don't use these much anymore, uh, these chlorofluorocarbons. And so again, this is another success story because over the last 10 to 15 years, we have seen the ozone hole actually not get bigger. It's actually beginning to get smaller. And that's telling us that we are, it's working, right? So again, give ourselves a, a, an applause here. Okay. Uh, those at Montreal Protocol 1989, again, started this process with the, with the Coben Hen, uh, Hagen Amendment and then kind of took took the lead on, which basically phased out these CFCs and therefore protecting uh, our ozone layer. So what are some of the effects of ozone depletion, all right, on human health? Uh, you get worse sunburns, which can then cause to eye, cause eye cataracts and skin cancers, and it can get immune system suppression for food and forest, reduces the yields for some crops, uh, reduced seafood supplies due to smaller uh, cytoplankton populations, and decreased forest productivity for UV-sensitive tree, uh, tree species. Wildlife, more eye cataracts, shrinking populations of aquatic species sensitive to UV radiation, and disruption of the aquatic food web, webs due to the shrinking of cytoplankton populations. Ozone depletion, its effects on air pollution and climate change, increases our acid deposition, so the acid rain, uh, increases photochemical smog, degradation, uh, degradation of outdoor painted surfaces, plastics, and building materials. And again, while in the troposphere, uh, CFCs actually act as a greenhouse gas, so that even intensifies uh, the greenhouse effect and, and, and global warming. All right. So that's it, guys. That is the end of my lecture on Chapter 19, Air Pollution and Ozone Depletion. And as always, thanks for listening.